Hey guys, I wanted to post my last video here for chapter 11 on the nervous system. Wanted to start by doing a little bit of review, contrasting action potentials and graded potentials. I think it's a good idea to try to create um, a T-chart with graded potentials on one side and action potentials on the other, and then going down the list, noting some of the key distinctions. So I'll try to help you with that. I've got some review questions as well. Then I wanna go into, okay, this idea of, if an action potential is all or none, that either a neuron either fires an action potential or, or it doesn't, then how can intensity be encoded? How does our body, our brain, interpret a strong stimulus from a weak one? Then I want to look at um, in the events of an action potential, what's the difference between an absolute and a relative refractory period? And how, in addition, does that contribute to the one-way transmission of an action potential? So that's going to take us into this discussion around uh, propagation of an action potential. And I'll contrast the saltatory um, propagation with what's called continuous propagation. So that's where we're headed. So first of all, coming to this idea of what are some of the key distinctions between a graded potential and an action potential? So one of which is this idea of summation. So with a graded potential, you can add events in time, temporal summation. You can also add them in space. So make sure to refer to the first video that I posted for a discussion around these concepts, or excuse me, the second video. But with temporal summation, you have multiple action potentials coming down this green neuron here. And because of the frequency, those events can add in time to stimulate the neuron here in yellow. With spatial summation of this yellow neuron, you have this neuron and this neuron and this neuron coming in from different locations that are all working to stimulate this yellow neuron. Now, in contrast, with an action potential, you can't have summation. You can't have one action potential add with another to give you a big action potential, right? This idea of all or none means that it's not possible to have a small action potential or a big one or a medium one, right? They're going to be the same every single time, okay? So you cannot have summation with an action potential. Okay, so that's one really important contrast between those two concepts. Um, another one is the location of the event. So with a graded potential, you see that they can come in either via the dendrites or the cell body. So you can have a neuron coming in and attaching here to stimulate any one of the dendrites. You can also have it coming in through the cell body. And you'll see that also illustrated with that whiteboard video that I posted. In contrast, with an action potential, it's going to travel down the axon and it'll start at the axon hillock here. So this is the only place where you're going to see an action potential travel. You're never going to see an action potential traveling down here. Similarly, you're never going to see a graded potential traveling down this axon. Okay. Um, going to another key point of contrast is how far these two types of communication have the ability to travel. So with a graded potential, remember that they are going to dissipate they degenerate. I kind of describe it as a wave of energy that can that can peter off. And so, so here, we're going to see that they travel short distance, typically within the cell body to the axon hillock. So let's say there was a neuron coming in here. It stimulates this part of the membrane, depolarizes it, and then maybe, or hyperpolar polarizes it so it could have a stimulatory or an inhibitory effect with a graded potential. Um, and so that's going to travel a short distance to the axon hillock. Whereas with an action potential, it travels a long distance. It's going to go from this axon hillock or trigger zone through the entire length of the axon. And that's true whether or not that axon is just a few millimeters long or if it's over a meter long. Okay. Um, so that's definitely an important contrast. And, and keep in mind that a graded potential leads to an action potential, right? The only way that we get this action potential going down the axon of this neuron is if graded potentials coming in elsewhere in the neuron built to the point of hitting threshold, 
Okay, so you can't have an action potential without first generating those graded potentials and getting us to that point of threshold. So some review questions for you all here. Let me move my picture. A good chance to pause the video, see if you can answer these questions on your own. So with the first one, maintenance of the resting membrane potential. Now notice we're emphasizing the resting membrane potential here. So the rec correct answer is gonna be both A and B. So that sodium potassium pump is critical to establishing that resting potential. I always refer to that pump as helping to set the stage for an action potential, pushing all of that sodium out, going against a gradient, pulling the sodium, excuse me, um, pulling the potassium in again, and because it's going against a gradient, we are having, or rather the neuron is having to extend um, to utilize ATP in order to get that sodium and potassium to move against the gradients. Um, this one down here, depolarization of the neuron refers to an increase in the membrane potential. So we are going from, let's say negative 90 um, closer to threshold. So we are going up, the membrane potential is increasing. So that would be the correct answer there. Now these are all true false and a lot of them get at the same concept, but I want you all to, to take a look and see if you can take a stab at answering these as well. So again, pause the video. Okay, so temporal summation occurs with graded potentials. Hopefully the review I just did was helpful here. The correct answer, oops, sorry, the correct answer here should be true, right? Absolutely, with graded potentials, you can have them adding in time. If the question was phrased, spatial summation occurs with graded potentials, that would also be true. Um, this one here, EPSPs and IPSPs. So excitatory postsynaptic potentials and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials can summate spatially and temporally. True, right? These are graded potentials, right? In contrast with an action potential, it is always going to have um, a, a hyperpolarization, excuse me, a depolarization to begin the event, whereas with graded potentials, they can either be positive or negative. So that's gonna be true. And then this last question, spatial summation occurs with action potentials. So false, right? You can't have adding with an event that is all or none, okay? So this is going to be false. All right, so moving to this idea of stimulus intensity. So if an action potential, potential fires in an all or none response, how does our brain, how does our central nervous system distinguish a weak stimulus from a strong one? How can our eyes interpret dim light from a bright light? Or our ears interpret a quiet sound from a loud sound? Because if you think about it, an action potential, it's almost like Morse code, right? Um, it's gonna be the same every single time. So you can see the action potential shown here. They are hitting that exact same membrane potential every time. So I like the analogy of Morse code because it's almost like if you can imagine, you know, tapping a pen on my desk here, right? Um, the loudness, the intensity of that click is going to be the same each time. But what we can do to encode that intensity is we can vary the frequency. And so that's the answer here. Um, that's how our central nervous system can interpret this. Um, like my little meme here, my favorite frequency is 50,000 hertz. You probably have never heard it before. Um, so a strong stimulus cause action potentials to occur more frequently. So a bright light would look more like this with the action potentials being occurring more frequently in time um, in contrast to this, such as a dim light. And you can see that stimulus coded down here as well. So please don't mix or confuse stimulus intensity with this idea of temporal summation. Remember that temporal summation only occurs with graded potentials, and we are now no longer talking about what would cause a neuron to fire. 
we are saying, okay, that neuron is firing. It is communicating information onto the next muscle, the next neuron, the next gland, right? So how is it that action potentials can communicate their message in varying ways? And it all comes down to frequency. Okay, so next up is an absolute versus a relative refractory period. So take a look at that Bozeman science video that I linked to that walks you through the events of an action potential. And it's summarized here, right? So in the depolarizing phase of an action potential, sodium is going to enter. In the repolarizing phase, potassium is going to leave. And so after... As, as we begin to return to baseline, we can break up this refractory period into what is considered um, an absolute refractory period here, as well as a relative refractory period here. So during the absolute refractory period, what we're saying, consider that all of those voltage-gated sodium channels are open, right? You can't have any more open. And so if that neuron were to be stimulated by another neuron, it would not have the ability to respond, okay? So during this period, um, at the peak of our action potential here, our neuron, again, cannot respond to any incoming stimulus. It's already in the process of firing. It can't fire any um, more intensely, any, with any more intensity, okay? Um, I'm going to revisit this idea in the next slide, but what this absolute refractory period serves to do is it's going to enforce one-way transmission, meaning that if this is the cell body of my neuron and this is the axon, we can only have an action potential going in this direction. We are never going to have an action potential going backwards up the axon towards the cell body. That's not possible. And it largely has to do with this absolute refractory period. Okay, so hold on to that thought. And then with a relative refractory period, so from here onward, most of those sodium channels have now closed. And some of the potassium channels are open during this period. So because most of those sodium channels have closed, it is possible for that the neuron that we're seeing here, that's being illustrated here, it is possible for it to generate another action potential, but it would have to be a really strong stimulus because what happens essentially during this relative refractory period is our threshold is essentially going to be elevated. And so in order to get that neuron to fire, there's got to be far more input coming into that neuron to generate that action potential, okay? So that's the key difference between an absolute and a relative refractory period. With an absolute, the cell abs absolutely cannot respond to incoming um, stimulus, whereas with a relative refractory period, it can respond to a stimulus, but it's got to be a particularly strong one. So the last concept that I want to hit upon here is the propagation of an action potential, okay? So as an action potential propagates down an axon, the membrane just behind it is temporarily going to be in that refractory period that I was just describing, okay? I've got some video links here for you all, which hopefully helps to better understand this process. but Coming down here, what we're seeing in this graphic is three different illustrations in time. So we have an axon here and we have a recording electrode. So in this panel, we are taking a snapshot of events before the peak of the action potential shown in red reaches the electrode. Here we are taking a snapshot just as the peak of the action potential has hit that electrode. And then in this last panel, we are taking a snapshot of this neuron just after this action potential has left, okay? So in these three pan panes, so in this first one, we are still in resting potential. 
So we are going to see that this neuron is hanging out at negative 70. And note that this electrode actually is embedded in the axon. That's what we're, what we're seeing here. So the action potential, again, has not yet reached this electrode. And so it's still recording at negative 70. Okay. Now, the red is this action potential propagating down the axon. And so in this pane, the action potential is here. It has arrived, and we see that we that this event goes to the peak of our potential here. So we are actually going to reach positive 30 at the top of our action potential. And then after this action potential passes, notice that this gray area just behind the action potential is illustrating that hyperpolarization. So actually the absolute refractory period here, if you think about this part of the hyperpolarization, this axon can't respond, excuse me, this neuron can't respond to any additional events. So taking that idea here, it's as though all of those sodium channels are already open and it can't respond to an event. So it's not possible for this, for any of these sodium channels to open because they're already all open, right? This event cannot go backwards, okay? And so the way that an action potential propagates or passes down an axon is going to be very dependent on the myelination that we see in that axon. So in an unmyelinated axon, you see very slow progression. So an event, an action potential would pass along the axon at about two miles per hour. In contrast, if that axon is myelinated, it can go anywhere from 40 to 300 miles per hour down the length of that axon. Okay, so the, with an unmyelinated axon, this is what we're going to refer to as continuous propagation. And with myelinated axons, the physiology behind how it spreads is going to be referred to as saltatory transmission. So saltatory refers to, to jumping or leaping. So I always kind of have this image in my head of, of, a, of a kangaroo jumping from one node of Ranvier. So where the myelin breaks is going to be our node of Ranvier. So remember, this is our peripheral nervous system. The Schwann cells are going to be the ones that lay down this myelin. And the gaps between the myelin, again, is going to be where the node of Ranvier is. So with these myelinated axons, the voltage gates are only going to appear at this nodes of Ranvier. So the sodium can come in, and then the current essentially flows through the plasma of the cell, of the axon, into the next node. This is a better job of illustrating it. So continuous versus saltatory. So here's our myelinated axon. Here's our non-myelinated axon. So without that myelin, what we see is that as this action potential spreads, you basically have to have um, these voltage-gated sodium channels down every fragment of the axon. And that local current is going to have to stimulate every bit of it. So the local current really has to work hard with continuous propagation to be able to generate that um, depolarizing event down every bit of it. Whereas with a myelinated axon, that current can skip, right? That local current can pass. It's, it's insulated by the myelin here. So we don't need to have sodium coming in with every single fraction of a nanometer down the axon. It can skip, okay? And that's exactly what it does. And so we see sodium coming in here. It skips. Sodium comes in. It skips. Sodium comes in. It skips. And in that way, the action potential is going to pass down the length of the axon.